before we get into Ultima 7, I should discuss the Worlds of Ultima games that were released as spin-offs or sidequels to the main series. They didn't really have anything to do with the main story. Although you're still the Avatar, you're cast into situations that, frankly, have nothing to do with Britannia, Lord British, or the Virtues, or anything Ultima. They're called Savage Empire and Martian Dreams, which respectively put you in a very Doc Savage Pulp Fiction jungle safari, and a steampunkish H.G. Wellesy Martian story with well-known characters from history and literature. But I don't really have any plans to review those games in detail because, embarrassingly, I never played them. For a couple of reasons. Back even when they were new, copies of those games were pretty hard to find, and it's only lately that I've been able to track down copies online. The other reason I never played them, and I admit this is every bit as childish as when I mentioned it before, but they're both based on the Ultima 6 engine of gameplay, which I hated. For some reason, I just have a lot of difficulty getting comfortable with the interface of Ultima 6. But I'm told the stories in both games are completely awesome, so who knows? I'll play them again and approach them with an open mind. We'll see. Ultima 7 was the start of a new trilogy, and right away, when this game came out, everyone knew it was a game changer. Once again, Ultima would revolutionize the way RPGs were told and played, radically retooling its own gameplay and interface, and dramatically raising the bar technologically by presenting the most graphically intensive RPG to date. No kidding, I had to update my computer to play this. Although, come to think of it, even though I really loved games by Origin Systems, they had a really nasty habit of forcing me to completely upgrade my computer every time they released a new game. I watched their release dates like a hawk and simultaneously dreaded the day they finally came. I think I got my degree in computer science just so I knew how to build my own computer so I could play Ultima 7, Bioforge, Crusader No Remorse, and Wing Commander 3. God, this was an expensive addiction. Anyway, this game had a box like no other, and it was so strange that it immediately grabbed your attention and made you want to see what it was like. The box is almost completely featureless. It just says Ultima 7, The Black Gate, and boom, blackness. There's not a blurb on the back describing the plot or the gameplay. There's almost nothing there but a few tiny screenshots on the back you can barely see. It's saying like, this game is completely new and original, but if you want to know more, well, I guess you'll just have to buy the game, won't you? This whole design is just genius. It's striking and bold and minimalistic. It's all black. It's it's like, how much more black could this be? And the answer is none. None more black. And another cool innovation, a fully voiced intro. Okay, it was a cool innovation at the time. You never used to get this in games. No, no, that Britannia has entered into a new age of enlightenment. Know that the time has finally come for the one true Lord of Britannia to take his place at the head of his people. And all of the people shall rejoice and pay homage to their new guardian. Know that you too shall kneel before me, Avatar, for I shall be your companion, your provider, and your master. <laughs> this is the Guardian. I'm the Guardian. Ah, oh, no! Not that one! This is the Guardian of Ultima 7, and he is a far more effective villain. This guy literally sticks his head through your monitor and tells you he's gonna take over Britannia and shit on your couch because he's a big red motherfucker, and that's how he rolls. So you go over there and find that over 200 years have passed because time works differently between your two worlds, but it doesn't really matter because apparently people in Britannia live longer than Yoda because all your old companions are still alive and looking pretty good. The deal is that nobody here has actually heard of the Guardian except you, but since you've been gone, people have sort of forgotten about the whole Avatar thing and have started up a new similar religion called the Fellowship, which is less introspection, independence, and virtue, and more traditional church-going, passing collection plates, and singing hymns on Sunday. Even Lord British recommends that you join, since the Fellowship does a lot of good charity work and pretty much stands for all the same stuff you do, plus they give you a free necklace if you sign up and pancakes in the Fellowship Hall. Oh, that sounds great. I mean, except for the fact that they're evil pod people being controlled by a red dude from another dimension, and nobody will believe you. In fact, the first thing you see upon your arrival in Britannia is the brutal ritualistic murder of the local blacksmith. Oh, God. I mean, whoa. They even staked his manservant to the wall with a fucking pitchfork. Immediately, it's clear that in this game, the mood has officially changed. Shit just got real. And you better believe this stirred a lot of controversy back in the day. This was more graphic and brutal gore than had ever really been shown in an RPG up to this point. I mean, Jesus, this is stuff you'd see in the movie Seven. 
And yet, nobody makes the connection that this guy who was carefully staked to the ground, quartered with an axe, and his blood carefully collected in buckets has anything to do with the only organized religion in the world! Now, don't get me wrong, I like the story, but I think this is where the narrative really drops the ball. You've got a really interesting setup here. You're the Avatar, the founder of a religion or philosophy that's guided the world into salvation and enlightenment, and you return after two centuries to find that, well, basically it's grown obsolete. The world's moved on, evolved into a new way of thinking and practicing religion, and they're doing fine. People are happy giving to charity, and honestly, things are a lot smoother than when you were around. You remember that gargoyle war? Yeah, that was on you. I mean, sure, you may have your suspicions. The place is rather culty with their robes and secret medallions, and you suspect they might be trafficking in a new narcotic called Silver Serpent Venom. And of course, the, uh, the ritual murder and the nailing of a guy to a wall with a pitchfork, but it's all suspicion, it's nothing solid. You've got this dilemma here on whether or not you should really be meddling and telling people what kind of religion they can and can't worship. Or at least, you would have a dilemma if the game didn't immediately remove all ambiguity about the Fellowship being irredeemably evil. <laughs> There's no surprises here. From the beginning, the game just outright tells you these guys are the villains. The first thing I wanted to do was to kick down the door of the Fellowship Hall and start beating some answers out of dudes, but of course, you can't do that. You have to follow the breadcrumb trail of clues through the whole game, which leads to the Fellowship, but way to ruin the suspense here by having this guy appear and twirl his mustache at you. They don't even try to pretend like this Guardian guy might be on the level, like he might really be a benevolent deity. I, just, I don't know, it bothers me. But somebody answer me this. Why does the Guardian even bother to taunt you in the first place? His ultimate goal is to build this interdimensional black gate, come through, and take over the world. Of course! But why advertise your presence? To rub my face in it or something? Wait until after you've won, dude! If you'd never said anything, I'd never have known you'd taken over Britannia until it was way too late! I'd still be looking for that some bitch who stole my Xbox at the end of Ultima 5. Instead, you had to go and piss me off and ensure that I'm coming to Britannia to try to stop you. Okay, so you find the murdered blacksmith and try to find evidence of the Fellowship's involvement. You're joined by the blacksmith's son, a little kid named Anakin, I mean, Spark. He's quick, but obviously not much with a sword, so naturally I did the logical thing and gave him a shotgun. What? I'm the goddamn Avatar, I'm supervising him! But yeah, it's pretty much the plot. It starts off really simply. You're chasing the suspects of the murder, two Fellowship missionaries named Elizabeth and Abraham, all over Britannia and fighting crime on the way. Eventually, you discover the Fellowship is secretly working to bring the Guardian into the world by constructing a blag ho and to prevent anyone from interfering, they also build these weird geometric generators that have ruined the magical ether, disrupted the moon gates, and driven all the wizards on the planet uselessly mad. Elizabeth and Abraham are always one step ahead of you in this story, and the only way to follow them is to go undercover in the Fellowship. The main villains are really the creepy head of the Fellowship, Batlin, and his right-hand pirate man, Captain Hook. Yes, it's really Captain Hook. You also have to talk to fucking Chuckles again in this game, and to get a vital clue, you have to play the game. This was infuriatingly annoying back in the day, since you had no idea how to play the game, nobody tells you, and this was before you could just look stuff up on the internet. When you finally figured it out, you wanted to skin Chuckles alive and throw his carcass in a salt mine. The trick is, you have to use only one-syllable words, and if you don't, he stops talking to you, and you have to start all over again. Oh, and by the way, I reviewed the footage from the last review, and Chuckles fucking cheated! He used a two-syllable word! What asshole wrote his jokes anyway? Like I said, the plot is somewhat frustrating when you already know the guy in charge of the Fellowship is evil, but you have to play along with the story like a dope and do all the things Batlin asks you to do to prove your body thetans are purged or something. Batlin gives you a quest to prove your worth of the Fellowship by sending you to collect a hidden cache of Fellowship funds from the dungeon Destered. Do not worry, it is completely deserted. Uh-huh. Deserted my ass! Fuck you, Batlin! This place is full of fucking dragons! Look at all the fucking dragons! Look at them! How the fuck did they get a chest here in the first place? And when you go back to confront him with his lies that lured you into certain death, oh, he's ready for you. With an apology. Yeah! And you have to put up with it! Fuck this! I want to shove my sword up his ass! Why can't I kill this dickhead? Uh, anyway, the most awesome part of this game is an expansion pack called the Forge of Virtue, which adds some weird new island that mysteriously rises out of the ocean, causing earthquakes and destruction all over Britannia. Lord British tells you to go check it out, and when you do, you find it's the ruins of Castle Exodus from Ultima 3. But sadly, there's no killer grass surrounding it now. 
The black core at the heart of Exodus is still beating, and you have to pass the test of truth, love, and courage to banish it to the vortex. Yep, you gotta get rid of the dark core of Exodus. Why do we keep leaving these pieces of the world-destroying monsters just laying around to destroy and corrupt the world? Is it too much to ask Lord British to send some guys to clean up after I'm done? You remember at the beginning when I said this game was violent and dark? Yeah, oh yeah, that was nothing. That was barely the beginning compared to the other shit you see in the dungeons of this place. I mean, oh, oh my god. Oh Jesus, look! A sorcerer just sacrificed a baby to summon a demon flanked by a horde of headless abominations. Look at the bones! I don't think I've ever seen a game this dark and graphic. I mean, okay, you saw a mass grave for children in SWAT 4, which is one of the most nightmarish things I can imagine, but even in that, you didn't actually see a ritualistically vivisected infant on an altar to a dark god. Anyway, the whole point of the Forge of Virtue expansion pack is to create an obsidian sword, and to give it power, you infuse the blade with the trapped greater demon. This is where the game gets simultaneously awesome and ridiculous. By the end of the Forge, your attributes are maxed, and when you exile the Dark Core of Exodus, Lord British raises your strength to double maximum. And you have the Black Sword, which can suck the soul out of any creature in the game and kill them instantly at your command. And you're supposed to be the good guy in this game. I'm not even kidding. You have the touch of death now. It doesn't matter what you want to fight, demons, dragons, hydras, whatever. You touch it, it dies. But I know what you're thinking, because it's the exact same thought that crossed every single gamer's mind in the world when the Black Sword tells you about its ultimate power. Can I use the touch of death on Lord British? You can kill the shit out of him. You even get a very theatrical scene where you take great pleasure in killing the lazy prick. There can be only one, you immortal fuck! This game spoils us. It's all about being a nice guy and not doing this sort of thing, but it still allows us to indulge in our perverted fantasies of ultraviolence every once in a while. You can also cause a loose brick to fall from an archway just as Lord British is walking under it and kill him that way. And I have no idea how anyone figured that out. Of course, the game is essentially unwinnable at this point, so I just settle for trapping Chuckles in a circle of black powder kegs and painting the walls with his fucking gore. Hey, you're not supposed to, but it's still a great game that rewards you for exploration and gives you an outlet to venture frustrations. Like, FUCK YOU CHUCKLES! By this point, your character is basically death incarnate and the game is absurdly easy since no force in Britannia can stand before you and your sword drinks the souls of the guilty and innocent alike. Well, except for the four villains in the last battle, because I guess even the Demon of the Black Sword has a sense of fair play. Oh, and just in case you were thinking you could use the Black Sword to kill Batlin, since he's obviously the chief villain Scientologist, the Black Sword says no because it doesn't really want to. So I can kill Lord British and make the game unwinnable, but killing the villain, which is logical, I can't. Oh, jeez, cute. Speaking of being godlike, the game still gives you the option of casting the Armageddon spell, which kills all life on the planet except for Lord British and Batlin for some reason. I just don't get this. Why would it give you this option? It's like the game is deliberately handing you the history eraser button and then telling you very nicely not to push it. So of course you do it! Why in the hell would another wizard sell you the Armageddon spell? Why would you sell a deranged religious nutjob the Armageddon spell? It's not worth the money if you never get to spend it. There's a lot of weird stuff in this game, too. I mean, whacked out loads of Easter eggs. If you go to Serpent's Hold, you'll find that every character there is the crew of Star Trek The Next Generation. The second best weapon in the game is a gardening tool called the Hoe of Destruction. The Hoe of Destruction. I am dead serious. Hey, don't underestimate the lethality of garden tools. You remember that pitchfork that nailed the gargoyle to the wall? I call that one the Pitchfork of Annihilation. But the Hoe of Destruction story? It gets better! You find the magic hoe in the tool shed of a guy who lives near the crash site of a Kilrathi starfighter from Wing Commander. I am so not even kidding about this! This guy tells you all about the crash, mentions the Kilrathi by name, implying that not only the Wing Commander and Ultima series exist in the same continuity, but this must mean the Kilrathi are actually the dudes in the TIE Fighters you were shooting down to become a space ace in Ultima 1! I know, right? I just blew my own mind! And no, you can't just hop in the starship and fly around, although that would pretty much make this game the most awesome thing ever. There's also loads of nudity and sex in this game. It's weird. You never used to see this in games. Not only is there a bizarre nudist colony living inside a cave of giant bees. Didn't I start off this review by saying how much more mature and sensible this game was than Ultima 1? Hmm. Huh. 
So anyway, yeah, there's a family of nudists, and they live inside a cave of giant bees. One place I'd think you really wouldn't want to be a nudist, but aside from that, you can go to Buccaneer's Den and nail dirty pirate hookers on Whore Island. And just in case your hardtack's buttered on the other side, you can actually go to the brothel and have the male pirate prostitute Roberto polish your mizzen mast. I'm not sure how prostitution fits in with the eight virtues, but this has to be a landmark in gaming. Being able to play an openly gay character in an RPG? It's something, anyway. There's also a flying carpet hidden in the mountains. Best way to travel in the game. And I know it seems like nitpicking, especially after mentioning the Kilrathi Starfighter, but it always makes me laugh that the flying carpet comes equipped with eight bucket seats. I can show you the world, shining, shimmering, splendid. I really liked this game back in the day, but it definitely helped that I bought the strategy guide, because otherwise I would have never figured out what the hell I'm supposed to do. The quests are so complex, it's easy to lose track of what you're doing and who you're doing it for, and there's no journal feature to remind you if you ever take a break and forget. Each step in the process is littered with a dozen more sub-steps and favors you have to perform for everyone you meet. For example, the Guardian has set up these magic generator devices around the world to disrupt the ether, screw up the moon gates, and brainwash the weak-minded. But to destroy them, you first need to contact the Time Lord. No, not that one. But let's just take this one step as an example. You have to contact the Time Lord so we can tell you how to destroy the generators, but you don't know where he is. First, you have to play the game with Chuckles, who tells you to talk to a fortune teller. The fortune teller tells you to ask the Wisps, who are extra-dimensional beings who know where the Time Lord is. But you can't talk to the Wisps because they only communicate with a woodland race of Ewoks known as the Emps. But the Ewoks won't talk to you until you give them honey, which is their favorite food. And the only way you can get honey is to go to the Cave of Giant Bees, past the Nudist Colony. To get past the bees, you need smoke bombs from a local hunter. You use the smoke bombs to get the honey, you give the honey to the Ewoks, but they still won't help you contact the Wisps until you get permission from their leader. And their leader won't give you permission until you convince a nearby group of loggers to stop cutting down the Silverleaf trees. So you stop the loggers, the Ents give you a whistle to talk to the Wisps. So you find the Wisp, blow the whistle and talk to the Wisp, but the Wisp won't tell you where the Time Lord is for free. You have to trade him a notebook of a famous Britannian sage named Alagner. Alagner won't give you his notebook until you can tell him the answer to life, the universe, and everything, which you can only find out from a guy named Kane and Scarabray. But Scarabray was wiped out by a Lich and is also turned into a land of the walking dead. So to talk to anyone who's dead, you need the Seance spell. The island is also conveniently surrounded by giant white monoliths of rock, and there's no place to land your carpet. So you have to go on foot and pay the undead ferryman. Only a ghost named Kane knows the answer to your question, but he won't talk to you until you destroy the Lich. The only way to destroy the Lich is to imprison a magic cage and dump a special magic potion on it. But to get the cage, you need to convince the ghostly blacksmith to finish making it. To do that, you need to find his wife's ring. She only gives you the ring when you play your music box. When you give the smith the ring, he agrees to make the cage, but first he needs an iron rod. So you give him a rod, he gives you the cage, but now you have to enchant it. To enchant the cage, you need to make a special alchemy potion. Put the Lich in the magic cage, dump the magic potion on him, and kill the Lich. But then you need to find someone willing to sacrifice themselves to destroy the Lich as well as souls, forcing you to talk to everyone on the island. And finally, Cain tells you there are no answers to life and death. You tell Alagner this who says you can have his notebook, actually he says you can have the key to his warehouse which has the notebook in it, which of course is a labyrinth full of bullshit teleporters and secret doors. You find the notebook, give it to the Wisp who tell you to reach the Time Lord, you have to drop your Orb of the Moons one step to the Northwest, but you don't have an Orb of the Moon so you have to talk to Lord Bridge who gets you a spare! <laughs> that was one quest! Actually, that was half of one quest because I didn't even talk about how to free the Time Lord from his prison. That's the second part, and I'd explain it, but I don't feel well. The Time Lord explains that the Black Gate is powered by a major celestial alignment of all the planets, and time is short. Although, that could all just be orbital wobble. But to make a long story slightly less long, you blow up the generators, find out where the Black Gate is, and attack the Fellowship Stronghold, which has been prepared by the Guardian's faithful minions to be his glorious dread fortress upon his arrival. Why, to welcome their conquering god, they've even constructed a massive imposing throne in the surprisingly small room barely big enough to hold it, with human-sized doors and a sweeping view of a blank stone wall and a couple barred windows. What kind of throne room is this? A throne room for ants? How am I supposed to get in? I need leg room, people. And come on, I may be a dark god of deceit and domination, but even I need a little lumbar support. It's worth mentioning your companion AI isn't all that good, because they stay in formation so tightly they often blunder directly into death traps. But you're basically invincible by now anyway, so all you need to do is run to the last encounter and just kill anything blocking your path. When you finally get to the chamber with the Black Gate, battling six Captain Hook on you, who attacked me with his oh-so-deadly whip, once you kill him, Batlin bails out, leaving you alone to blow up the Black Gate. Oh, you 
cannot do that! You must not! Again, perhaps your puny Earth shall be my next target. <laughs> Dude, what's the matter with you? Stop telling me your evil plans. If I know what they are, I can stop you. You know, like I just freaking stopped you. You think he'd learn at some point? Ah. Kuapara, I call upon the power of the gods! What is thy bidding, my master? The celestial alignment approaches. Prepare a new black gate. This world of yours will make a fine addition to my dominion. But what if Hulk Hogan? Or the spoony one. Try to stop us. Ha 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 